Yeah, it's still saying starting room. Okay, good. I, was, I wasn't sure if recording was one of the things that might also be problematic at the moment, but no, it worked. Okay, so welcome everyone to the uh, February uh, 2023 uh, Microsoft 365 Modern Management Meetup. So there's a, a massive turnout of people in person. Uh, we've got three more people in the room than we had last month. Yes, we didn't have any. We didn't have a room last month. Exactly. So you know, so that's pretty good. Like pretty good growth rates. <laughs> yeah. Um, so other things as well is um, yeah, Ben's not here uh, this month. Ben Ben's got a bunch of travel coming up, so he's just had to make sure he can keep the home front running smoothly before he disappears again and yeah. again and again. Uh, but just, uh, yeah, otherwise, uh, my name's Mark O'Shea, and to my left. Over here. Yeah, I was confused because I was looking in the camera. Yeah, I was looking. I was like, <laughs> So I'm Steve. I work for Microsoft. Uh, and you can find me on Twitter as on-prem cloud guy. And I am Jeroen from the Netherlands. And you can follow me at Twitter as well, yeah. as shown and in the slide. So you're definitely not in the room with us today. No, I'm definitely not in no. the room. No. But, but I, think I, you, I was you thinking about to, to go to, to Sydney, but yeah, it's a little bit yeah. more expensive. Yeah. <laughs> you, you actually looked at the price of flights and went, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, I looked so, it into the prices in November or December or something like that. Still expensive. Yeah, uh, 2,600 euros or something. So. Yeah, it's starting Four to get week. a bit, bit more reasonable then. Back to the old, or well, not quite old no. pricing, but closer. Yeah. Okay, so for today's topics, we'll sort of just quickly, we'll talk about just anyone who hasn't been before. Uh, we did have a bunch of new people sign up via Meetup, but I don't know if we've actually got anyone new turn up. It looks like quite a few familiar names, or not quite a few, it looks like Mostly. the few names that we have are familiar, familiar names. Yeah. Um, That's okay. But we do have a, a newbie in room with us, so not to put you on the spot, but in a moment, we are definitely you are going to have to do an, in, your, an introduction, Okay. and you have to explain how you know Steve. As, okay. that's an imp and your initial impressions of him. These are <laughs> important things that we need to track for historical yeah. purposes. Just remember it will be rated. <laughs> yeah. 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 And then, so then we'll talk about our workplace ninjas. So making sure we get people along to that. And I was actually hoping we had a few more people here for this one to help drive the workplace ninjas attendance, uh, even just to make sure that, like, if anyone was coming from interstate, and wanted to sort of catch up the night before or anything that they, you know, they didn't have to sit in their hotel room yep. alone. So I don't know. So, you know, maybe some people will watch it later and let us know, hey, we're coming to Sydney. And then just really, uh, just a brief topic, some upcoming Microsoft 365 exam changes. All up, um, my review is pretty good, the changes. Um, most people will be, people who are planning on doing exams as opposed to people who have done exams will be pleased with the changes. Um, mm -hmm. And grumpy people who've done the exams will not be happy with the changes. <laughs> I, I haven't done the exams. Uh, and I'll explain what I mean by that as we go through. And then also, and then I guess the proper topic today is really part two to what we started last month. So last month we focused a lot on Winget, some of the different repository, repository pieces, but we stayed away from a lot of the Intune integration and store business replacement side of things because there's still a details lacking there is a um, I think that's a way of describing it that won't get me in too much trouble. Um, now there are a couple of blog posts, but I'm always oh, sorry, there are a couple of Microsoft blog posts, but I'm always wary of pointing people to blog posts because in a lot of cases it's an opinion based on a point in time as opposed to a support article or something on, I was about to say docs. I'm not allowed to say docs anymore. Learn. learn. Uh, you yeah, need to learn. learn docs to learn, learn. Yes. Um, so there's, yeah, and even right now, there's still like a lot of the, I guess I shouldn't call it the old documentation, but the current soon to be outdated documentation 
still doesn't really have, like, not, you'd sort of think at the top of every page of that documentation, it would be this thing is end of life and at the end of um, end of March. But it's kind of sporadic. You'll find it in some places, in other places, it's kind of just ignored altogether. Uh, so we just want to make sure everyone's on track with that one. And then, as per usual, we'll, um, after that, we'll switch over to general discussion. That's where we switch off uh, the recording, just so that anyone's got any kind of sensitive questions they want to ask that they don't want there being like a video recorded version of it. Yeah, and we'd rather not have to go through and edit the video afterwards to strip things out. So it's just easiest uh, thing. We'll, we'll change that statement to we're not going to because we're not needing to. What, strip anything out? Yeah, we're not stripping yeah. anything. Oh, no, because we don't record that section, we, we would never have to strip anything out because it's not recorded. But even if we did and you say something inappropriate, yeah. we're not removing it. Oh, no, not, no, not inappropriate. But someone asking a sensitive question that I know. they don't really want coming back to haunt them. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So do we have a, a new <laughs> attendee? Yes, yeah, all right. Fun. So hello, I'll, I'll start the introductions. Um, I'm Dominic um, from Sydney. Um, this has been probably my third or fourth time um, watching, well, being a part of one of these meetups, but first time attending in person. Um, I, I do have a bit of a history with Steve. My first um, job in the industry um, was looking up to Steve uh, in the office um, and learning a lot off him. Um, but yeah, it was very short, sweet, knowledgeable. Um, whenever needed something, um, but also inspirational in the same way because, you know, you know, that knowledge comes with a lot of experience and times and battle scars. Um, but since then, um, we've both gone our separate ways. I'm part of the Telstra team now doing a similar kind of work internally for Telstra. And I dev, um, it's a small world. <laughs> um, so maybe I'll point a finger at dev next. Hello. Can you hear me? Oh, yes. Hey, uh, I'm Dave Panchal. Um, uh, Dominic and I have uh, met very briefly uh, when I was in the uh, in the same team in EUC when I was working as a level four uh, lead uh, EUC engineer. Uh, but since then, uh, like last year, I made a move and went to the consulting side, the dark side. Um, and uh, now I'm with Telstra Purple. Uh, it will be a year uh, in two months time. So um, I have a pleasure of working with uh, different industries now and uh, transforming their um, landscape from the endpoint point of view into the modern management side of things. So um, yeah, glad to see you Dom over there, <laughs> a familiar face. Um, so yeah, glad to be here um, and look forward to um, what we are going to discuss next. Thank you. Okay, I can go next, I guess. My name is Pallavi, and um, I work as a technology auditor. Um, I'm here just out of curiosity because my company is going to roll out Office 365 later um, during quarter three. So I just wanted to know more about it. Excellent. Awesome. Anybody else want to uh, come off mute? Oh, oh. Hi all, um, I'm Mark. Um, I'm starting a, a new role in my company as a um, digital workplace architect. So I have been probably uh, more focused on the infrastructure side for a few years. So getting back into the Office 365 space and trying to learn more. Excellent. Nice. Hi there, that's Rash. Uh, nice to see you. It's my first time at the meetups. Uh, I recently became uh, the first MVP for Australia for Windows 365. Congratulations. Excellent. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And I work for Dell Technologies and I'm essentially a digital uh, workspace uh, architect and mainly focusing on end user computing as well as I have background in infrastructure. Um, first time meeting you all, I, I was planning to come in person. Uh, sorry, it couldn't make it, but definitely next time I'm going to come in person and meet you guys. Awesome. Yeah. Make sure you bring your colleague Nick with you. 
<laughs> Nick Hogan, right? That's the one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we yeah. have to figure out how do we how do we get Nick into the room? Is it like free pizza or what? The problem is it's in North Sydney yeah. and he's in Manly. And he's like, no, no, it's too hard to get from Manly to North Sydney. Yeah. It needs better if it's in the CBD. It's like tell him he like it's he doesn't have to tell. I was about to say he doesn't have to cross the bridge, but he has to cross the spit bridge. Yes, which is the North <laughs> Sydney person's equivalent of the Harbour Bridge. Correct. Yes. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he stopped blogging. And I was telling him the MVP renewals are right around the corner. So what's happening? So It'll be it, fine. The dude is a bit scared right now about that. <laughs> uh, we'll do a couple of videos. He'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice okay, to not a problem at all. Nice to meet you as well. Anybody else or shall we move on? I think we we know everybody else. So some of our new registrations this month paid off. <laughs> okay, so let's just sort of jump in probably just to do some cross promotion for Workplace Ninjas. So they're having an in-person event here in what, like yeah, 17th of March. Yep. Uh, so if you are in the Sydney area uh, and you haven't registered yet, uh, I'll drop that link into chat for you. Just so I know Jose's on the uh, course. Does he want to come off mute and talk about uh, what workplace and injuries and everything associated? If you could, yeah. Hello, everyone. Yeah, just sorry, I'm just at home on Daddy Care, but like I'll take a, I'll take a minute. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, workplace ninja uh, following. The other user uh, user group countries. I think it started with the guys in in Switzerland, then migrated to a bunch of different countries in Europe. And then when I was there for the Workplace Ninja Summit uh, late last year, they, we just had a chat with the guys and I said, oh, we should bring the, the user group to Australia." And I said, "Yeah, let's let's lovely to do that." And then I just had a, a bunch of chats with Steve because Steve's been running the meetups group in here. And uh, we we need to build more community around that stuff. I, I see I see the the, the 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 monthly meetup as a really good thing, the three six five. But I also wanted to try to do some some stuff in person to start actually bringing people. So the idea initially for this year is we're gonna we're gonna be holding three events: one in Sydney, uh, that's gonna be the seventeenth of March; one in Melbourne, which is probably gonna be sometime around mid year, I think July, maybe August; and one in Brisbane, which is gonna be towards the end of the year. So that's the, the the whole idea is kind of a small subset of the workplace ninja, if you will. It's just a few deep uh, deep dive sessions and stuff. Uh, the Sydney one, we're also going to have a, a panel, like three three or four panelists talking about the experience migrating. So that will be like more uh, at a manager's level, or more tech people that um, that went through the hopes of migrating either from ICCM or if they didn't have any any other management tool or any other management tool to into doing how they feel, things they learn, and so they can share some learning with people that are looking to do that. But like, we're, we're trying to get more people that uh, that were on the customer side than actually consultants or someone like the people that are actually uh, is still on, on those environments and still still managing those. But that's pretty much it. it would like be really, be really good if anyone could attend. And one thing that we haven't uh, announced yet, but I probably can announce you guys is we're going to be uh, raffling one ticket for the Workplace Summit in Switzerland in October this year. I think it's early October, end of September. So everyone that attends is going to be running into the draw to be able to attend it in Switzerland. In Switzerland. Excellent. Okay, sorry, thank that, you. That, that took a lot more than two minutes, but sorry. No, 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 bring your wallet yeah. with you if you go to Switzerland. Yes. Yeah, well, yes, yes. So a, re a fact that I learned about Switzerland recently is that they've got enough bomb shelters for every resident of the country. Yes. So, you know, regardless of what's going on in the world, it's a good, <laughs> it's a good place to be. <laughs> yeah. Apart from all the other reasons. Yes. Yeah. We're not going to talk about why they need to have a bomb shelter. No. First. Oh, no, no. We <laughs> stay away from those topics. Yes. At least while we're recording. Exactly. So we'll continue <laughs> on. Okay. Um, but, yeah, make sure you do sign up to Workplace Ninja just to call out mm. stress. Uh, it is an in-person event. There is no plans to record any of the sessions. So if you're not there, you miss out. Sorry. Yeah, and I, yeah, and the thing that's kind of surprised me with this is like just like in general, because Microsoft hasn't really held an Ignite or anything like that. Like that's why I was expecting 
the seats for this to get snapped up immediately. But I think it's, it's like probably just some inertia to try to get yeah. people like for this thing where it's after hours, I kind of understand why people go, I could go home and eat or yes. go to that and get home several hours later. But for this one with the timing, et cetera, um, I, yeah, I think it's, yeah, maybe we just need to make sure we get some awareness out there and just keep pushing it to make sure that it's a success. Definitely. Okay, so moving on to just the short, a short topic, first of all, just some of the upcoming Microsoft 365 exam changes. So effectively here, there's um, a couple of, there's a couple of places where exams are being consolidated. Um, so first of all, I'll just sort of talk about them briefly and then talk about some of the, the reasons why exams get consolidated. So MD100 and MD101, which are probably the most appropriate ones for a lot of the stuff that we talk about, they are being retired in July, end of Ju 31st of July, and being replaced with MD102. That's uh, awesome. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not a shock now. I have to hold back on talking about those that one in particular because we've got a lot of details in the next slide on that one. But also um, some of the uh, two of the team's exams are merging as well. And in this case, it's there's like so currently there's three different team's exams. There's the team's exam, there's team's voice, and then there's team's troubleshooting. Now, team's troubleshooting is one that I don't know why that one exists um, because you're troubleshooting things that are covered in the other two exams already. So it's like, so the first two are like, what steps would you follow to set something up? And the other one is, what steps would you follow to make sure that something is set up? Oh, no, I get that. So there's, I, I but it, that. It's, it's, it's the difference between the consultant setting it up and the engineering maintaining it day to day operationally. In theory, you would think that. <laughs> but it ends up being, oh, that's an authentication issue. Uh, call-in plan hasn't been, yeah, it, just, it basically, the skills are too close to each other. But the two that they're merging are 700 and 720. And I think it all, it, to me, what the big takeaway with that with that merge is that, you know, voice is just, a, yeah, Microsoft just wants voice to be something that anyone who's got even non-voice exposure in Teams, they want people to know voice. So that when it's time to consider voice, if they haven't, you know, basically it's like, okay, rather than do we use voice with Teams, it's which voice option do we choose with Teams? So I completely understand uh, that one. Now, some of the, so, so let's just talk quickly about why do they consolidate exams? So I'm kind of surprised that it's taken this long, especially with, in, actually, there's one that I left, I left off MS100 and MS101 are also combining. Because yeah, they're about the same um, Because, yes, yeah. yeah, so with those, so why do they combine them? Uh, probably what, so this is my, this is based on people that, not all the people that I have to deal with on a regular basis, but a lot of the people that I deal with on, on a very regular basis is people who, anytime that there's more than one exam required to do a certification, the interest level for that person to do that certification plummets. So going back a few years, the Azure team had to go through and do consolidation. And the reasoning they had to do it was you could do two exams to become an Azure admin or certified, or you could do one AWS exam and become an AWS admin. And while you may be thinking, but you can't really compare AWS admin versus Azure admin, they're different things. It's like, no, like employers want to see that you've got a certification. They don't care which one you've got. They just want to see that you've gone through the effort of doing it. So someone who, you know, who just does one exam to get that certification, it's like, well, why wouldn't you go down the path? So the Azure team basically had to react to that. Now, on the M365 side, this is just, this is just pure speculation on my side. I don't think so realistically, especially with MD100 and MS100, those ones disappearing. What are the, what competition is there in the marketplace for certification there? No, no. It's, it's not that, it's not the same story that you've got. There's no, no, like there's no AWS versus Azure kind of competition there. So my best take on this is that, yes, simplifying it is great for people getting into it, but I would also guess that Azure certifications 
do one exam, get a certification. We're cannibalizing Microsoft 365 certifications. So people going, okay, this employer wants a Microsoft certification. Which one are you going to take? The one that does two exams, that takes two exams, or the one that takes one exam? And some of you who've been doing exams a long time might be thinking, oh, well, you know, I remember when I had to do seven exams to get my MCSE for Windows 2000. And it's like, yeah, and I hope I never have to go through anything like that again. So, <laughs> yeah, so people, so there are some people going, oh, one exam devalues it. And it's like the world has moved on. Get over it. Yeah, there's yeah, there's no polite way to say it's, you are so out of touch with the marketplace. Um, and it's and for me, it took a while for me to sort of come to grips with that is how this works today. Like you sort of, like you're thinking, surely if someone wants to get a certification, they're passionate about getting the certification. It's like no, they're doing it because it's required by their employer or their future employer. So it's it's so for me there was a bit of a, a mind shift where it's like, oh, and even things that you take for granted, such as you know, like I'm sure for most of us, taking an an exam, like a Microsoft exam and paying for it out of our own pocket, isn't something that's going to keep food off our table for months. But if you think about someone who's trying to get into IT and it's like, what is it, two hundred and forty dollars or whatever for yes. a non-discounted exam? I think it is, yeah. Yeah, yeah. something, yeah. So Sounds about right. Yeah, so someone going, hang on, I could either pay my bills this month or I could do an exam. It's like there's actual, it's not just the time that you put into the study, there's also, also the cost of it. So, yeah, so the world has moved on from, um, you know, sure there'll be some specialisations where multiple exams are going to be required, but anything that they can shift over to do an exam, get a cert, is going to be welcomed with open arms by most people, apart from those who are grumpy that they've done the two exams previously. And it's like, well, you've hopefully you've already gotten value out of what you got there. So I don't really understand you've devalued the effort that I've put in. It's like your exam transcript will still show that you did two exams. You can print it out on a big sheet of paper and show it to people to show that you're, you have value. <laughs> you can give yourself a, you know, print yourself a medal at the same time and pin it to the wall. Now, let's talk about something a little bit different, the MS500 exam in the middle. So this one is being retired, and I do not have a problem with that. I've seen people complaining, going, oh, why are they retiring it? And it's because it has no purpose to exist. It never has. Um, when that exam was, when I was preparing for that exam when it was in beta, I was going through the objectives going, okay, well, I've just sort of done MS100, MS101, MD100, MD101 betas. And then when I was looking at the exam objectives for this, it's like, I don't see anything unique that this exam is covering that wasn't in those other exams. Then when I did the exam, it's like, why am I getting a bunch of exactly the same questions <laughs> from those other exams? Because uh, the same people writing the questions. The same people writing it. And sure, one of them, sorry, they weren't exactly the same questions. In some cases, they were Fabricam. In others, they were Contoso. Have to realize. Uh, so so it, it's never really served... It, it's never really offered anything unique apart from do one exam, get a certification. Now, the problem here with M365 security, so it's not a security exam, it's security and compliance. So first of all, the name doesn't accurately represent what's in it. Um, but what I generally find with this exam and similar applies to the Azure equivalent, AZ500, is it's an exam that I see is that generally people tend to have a fairly high failure rate with it because people are doing it because it's, oh, if I do this exam, I get a cert, as opposed to is this an exam I should actually be doing? Because people will go and do this exam knowing either knowing a bit about the security side of and security or compliance side of M365 or knowing a bit about M365, but not knowing all of the moving pieces underneath. So, yeah, so now there's even more exams that cover what's included with it. So that it just doesn't really, like to me, it's never really held a purpose. Um, now it's got even less of a purpose. Any of the things that it tests you on, if you want to get tested on that particular thing or group of things, there are other exams that can do it uh, much better. Uh, but that's one where I know there'll be people who probably disagree with me a bit more on that one. But, you know, that I, 
my step, my view on this one hasn't changed from when it was introduced. It's only gotten worse. It's like, you know, when they put out the updates, it's like, oh, you just added the two bullet points that were just added to the other exam. You added that Azure AD is part of Microsoft Entra to the exam description. Yeah, congratulations, that's a really great exam change. Now, moving on to the more important one for this, uh, MD-102. MD-102, it's got a good name. It's the Endpoint Administrator. Um, just in case, you know, calling it the Intune Administrator might have been a bit too specific. Um, but it's, yeah, it really is just MD-101. So it's the modern desktop exam. Um, and probably the something that I do see as a potential downside here is... For people who want to do just a core Windows troubleshooting exam, this exam is not going to include any of that stuff. Now, on the flip side of that, let me pull up an example of the kind of stuff that MD100, so that's more the troubleshooting uh, help desk kind of exam. Let's take a look at some uh, classic things that you may encounter in that exam. Uh, let me find the right browser session. Okay, MD100, oops, I need to share that, sorry. I'm not working the way I normally work with Teams here. Let me share browser. Okay, that's better. So configure storage on Windows clients. So you've all got a bit of an idea of maybe what's coming. Let's zoom in and take a look down the bottom. It's like, oh, hey, look at this. Things that you generally shouldn't be doing down on your Windows clients. Things like, <laughs> like it's like, no, we, we don't do these things on clients <laughs> anymore. <laughs> but this is what I mean kind of like by late. Like, it's, this is, like this exam has got so much legacy stuff in it. But don't worry, it gets better. Um, let's keep file and folder compress. So NTFS. File and folder compression is part of this exam. Thankfully, though, it doesn't expect you to know what the command line utilities are. To, oh, yeah. So this is, yeah, so this, so MD100 effectively, if, if you went through and looked at the questions, you could probably trace them all the way back to the first Windows NT 3.1 exam in a lot of cases. So things around the basics of NTFS, of uh, file permissions versus folder permissions versus share permissions. That's the kind of stuff that, yes, it's evolved over the years, but that's the kind of stuff that this exam asks you about. But here we go. We saved the best for last. Storage spaces on Windows. Um, is there a legitimate use of this in some workstation type scenarios? Yeah, but it's an edge case scenario. It shouldn't be part of a troubleshooting exam. So this exam is um, a lot of the content for this exam, and this is something that you'd probably... Yeah, that Phil can probably confirm. So, for, so Phil, the way that I remember that I know what this exam includes is if I think about all the different Windows launches I was involved with over the years, it's going back mentally through the list of what was new in this, what was new in that, what was new in that. And that is what this exam <laughs> asks you about. And so some of the, some of the multiple choice questions in it some of the answers are just these random 10-year-old Windows technologies that most people today would never have heard of, would have never have heard of. Oh, yeah. Uh, yes, but yep. this is Windows Server 2012 questions with storage spaces. Yeah, see, but yeah. on the server side, yes, like asking about storage spaces on server. But on the client side, it was, oh you know, it was a point solution. It was a, it was a yep. point in time solution to a problem that has disappeared. It was people going, oh, I've got all these 80 megabyte hard drives. What do I do with them? <laughs> Actually, 80 gigabyte, I should say, not a megabyte. Um, and it's like, oh, I'll put them all into a pool so they perform really poorly <laughs> because your CPU won't be able to uh, perform the Excel <laughs> commands fast enough to keep them uh, running at full speed. So, yeah, so this exam disappearing, like I don't have a major problem with it apart from just the fact that now there's no core, like someone who's sort of going in entry level help desk who needs to know how to troubleshoot Windows, as a, who is not most of us. Most of us are like, can you just reset the machine? <laughs> like that's our, you know, that is our troubleshooting solution. It's it's going to be cheaper and more effective for us than trying to figure out, oh, why does your yeah. driver behave slightly differently? It's like, no, we're just going to 
it, it, it's it's it was always meant to be the fundamental client OS. Yeah. So yeah, so something like that exam, I think it's like maybe one of the you know you've got like the people like that do the other like entry level networking exams and all that kind of stuff. It feels like that space is ripe to take on a a core Windows exam, and or, or it's not even the training, um, like but you know the exam and the certification. Um, and then that's the other thing that still kind of strikes me as weird that about that team's troubleshooting thing is it is this if, if they had a troubleshooting track for certifications, like it's like you know, like, you know Windows troubleshooting, Teams troubleshooting, Office three six five troubleshooting. That to me that would be kind of like a, oh you know you, you could map out the way someone could expand their skills. But as it is, it's just a bit you know MD one hundred disappearing. I to me. <laughs> It's it's long overdue in a lot of ways, but there are some core things in there that, you know, just things that you think people know about Windows. I, I you, you know the one thing that I want to see back on exams. DNS. I just want to see people going through and learning DNS again. Well, on on Azure exams, like. AZ-104 has got a bunch of DNS stuff in it um, and some of the Azure Architect stuff. Cool. At the cloud point, that's fantastic, yeah. but not how does the DNS work inside your perimeter? I know, look, the level of TCP IP troubleshooting in these exams is you see they show you the output of a command prompt and your IP address starts with 169. That's <laughs> Or your, your gateway is so out of whack with the IP address you've been issued. It's like... Yeah, we can see we can see what those issues are. Now let me switch back yeah. slides. So, 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 Jerome, as a trainer as well, add your add your thoughts into this. <laughs> um, yeah, how will I say that? Uh, it is a shame that they will cancel MD one hundred because then my book is nothing worth worth anymore. So. For the people that don't know, I wrote an exam guide for MD100, so that goes me my Monty check if you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I, I think you are probably right because when I am teaching the MD100, I will, yeah, not really skip some chapters like the storage spaces direct and the IP46 explanation, etc. But I will go just like a rocket to that. Uh, yeah. To the to, to the, the the chapters, and people are sometimes asking from why are you doing that? Because yeah, really you probably don't do anything with IPv6 because you have some smart network gurus for that. So oh yeah, that's true. Okay. Yeah, because but yeah, I hopefully MD102 will be more the Intune related. Uh, yes, yeah, so. Exam. Yeah, so what's so realistically MD102 is like 95% of MD101. And it's the so the new additions, that's basically I went through and because I'm doing a post on it, like they're just the things that I was able to quickly pull out that like these are the things that are actually new or different enough to be mentioned. Mm -hmm. So so realistically, anyone who's already preparing for MD101. Just do, or if there, if someone's preparing for MD100 and MD101, I just tell them to wait and do MD102, unless that desktop troubleshooting, you know, troubleshooting core Windows was an important, you know, working with recovery and all that kind of stuff. Um, but again, for us, because we mostly dismiss that stuff out of hand, going <laughs> just do a remote wipe and let me let me know if the issue is still there. Uh, now the other thing, and this is sort of tying back into something that. Uh, that was mentioned. I think we chatted about it on, uh, in earlier. Uh, you're on about the MDT stuff. So one of the things to me that's still a bit weird in this exam is that while they've they've kind of they have heavily or it looks like they've pretty much stripped out most, if not all, of the config manager references. The they still got like a significant chunk in there on MDT, which is. Right. Yeah, it's it's a weird, like having both makes sense, but just having MDT, it's like if someone's going cloud, I don't really see them. I don't see that much 
knowledge, you know, these days, most people who do anything autopilot, et cetera, like they, don't, they generally don't touch NDT. Um, yep. Now, some of the feedback that I sort of saw around this one was people going, well, they can't have MDT in there because it's not officially, it doesn't officially support Windows 11, et cetera. But those people who complained about that have got comprehension skills because there is nowhere in this exam description where they say that this is a Windows 11 exam, um, which for the next couple of years is okay. Because the other thing here is like if people are complaining that it does include Windows 10, I'd argue that exams are testing you on what you know and what you've been working with, not on things that you may have just started working with. So, yeah, so here when you sort of, if anyone sort of is complaining about things that are in there that aren't related to Windows 11, it's like, just go back, read the exam description. It doesn't say Windows 10 or Windows 11 anywhere. It just says Windows. Uh, and, but otherwise, if you look at what they've added in, like I don't really think there's any real complaints about what they've added in, um, like it's mostly mostly Intune related, or Intune in a holistic Intune, you know, all of the Intunes, not just Intune as we formerly, not the artist formerly known as Intune, it's the group known, now known as Intune is in there. Um, and good to see that uh, Laps for Azure AD made it in there. Now, conditional access stuff, I kind of wasn't sure whether to throw that in as new because it has been in there already, but they didn't specifically tell you what you needed to know about conditional access, whereas now they're saying you need to know it for you know, evaluating compliance via Intune and in basically incorporating with Intune for app protection policies. So pretty, you know, pretty straightforward stuff there. Now, anything else on your side, Jeroen, about the like MD102, anything that you saw in there that was a bit of a weird inclusion or something that was missing that you thought should be in there? Um, good question. This early morning. Um, yeah, no, yeah, I'm not really checked everything from the MD102 exam, but I hopefully um, it will be better than the uh, the, the 101, of course. And, like that. Yeah. Well, based uh, on how heavily they recycled the exam objectives, I'm guessing there'll probably be a significant amount of question recycling. Yeah, well. yeah, probably, yeah. yeah. Like, it's, it would be great if they could sort of throw everything out and start again. That, that's too expensive and it never happens. Yeah, but just what I mentioned, and I think uh, I thought you mentioned it as well a couple of minutes ago, the MTT part, uh, what is um, um, what is going to be teached in 101, I think, is going, yeah, it was on the exam guidelines from for, for 102. So I don't know if that's really true, yes or no. The MTT part. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's one that I I understand why there are probably people arguing to keep that in there because that's the thing they know about. But that yeah. would be the only reason why you would argue to keep MDT in here. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. But if you uh, yeah you yeah, you mentioned the new additions includes local administrative password solutions for Azure AD. Does that mean that local password solutions for Azure AD is coming? There are a lot of people waiting for this one. I oh, think. yeah. Well, it better be here by May, yeah. or at least it better be in public preview uh, by May. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. But even there, like, take a look at it, like the Intune connector for AD. So they're obviously not turning it into a complete cloud. Like, I thought this might have been the nice opportunity to turn it into a, you know, you know Azure AD join. Away you go, but uh, there's still, you know, the skeleton is reaching out from the grave to mm. prevent you from moving forward. <laughs> okay, so let's now jump into the main topic for today. Okay. Yep. This is the one that you requested. Yeah, I know. Based on this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so updating your Intune app deployment. So, um, so in case anyone did join after we sort of did the quick intro today, this is really just a follow-up to the WinGet conversation that we started last month, where 
we sort of went through some of the things just to sort of be aware of in terms of where Winget is versus where we need the ecosystem to be, because Winget is a command line tool. Uh, yes, so there needs to be UX for. But yeah, but, uh, yeah, sometimes we may want it to be available inside of a portal. Yes. For example. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So, so first of all, there has now been official communication that says March 31 is the official date for retirement. As opposed to them saying sometime in Q3, uh, we now have an official date. Um, and weirdly enough, I haven't seen it updated in any uh, learn content yet, but it was through, it was, it was basically through the MMD. It was announced through MMD via an MMD announcement through the Office 365 or M365 Admin Center. It was? It was. I'll pull it up on screen for you if you want. But let's do it without a camera on it, yes. Yes. I'll, I'll have a look at that. Yeah. Um, so so at least now it's, it's official. Um, yeah, so the concern that I had was because we weren't seeing, all we were being told is end of Q1 with no date being given. I, I think last month I probably said, yeah, based on that information so far, I've got concerns about that date actually happening without it being pushed out. But, you know, there's a date there. Microsoft never changes the date that they say something is going to happen. So, you know, so when we wake up on the 1st of April, you know, store for business is gone. <laughs> yeah, no way <laughs> anything could ever be different <laughs> to that. <laughs> April Fool's. Yeah. So... So then uh, just a few other things in here is like so far that if you are, so the next bullet point, the Microsoft Store app new. So this is just using Intune to go through and do deployments and choosing you know, Windows. I want to deploy a Microsoft Microsoft Store app new. Uh, right now it's, you do a search. If you do a search for Microsoft, it will give you a list of things. It will tell you whether they're UWP or Win32. To avoid disappointment, don't click on anything that says Win32. Because it's going to pop up on the next or on that screen and say, "Oh, sorry, these aren't available at the moment." <laughs> so it's really only your traditional UWPs that are in there right now. Um, hopefully, that's something that we see change by April one at the late, at the absolute latest. Um, other things we covered this one briefly last month, but you know, any of your current uh, app targeting, etc., it's not going to be uh, that's using uh, Business Store at the moment. It's not going to be automatically migrated to the new, yeah, they're not basically picking up your old rules and or your old deployments and moving them across. So you'll just need to go through and, you know, set those up again, but we'll talk about why that's potentially a good thing. Um, now, probably the, the most important app to think about at the start of this whole process is the company portal app. So if you're currently using Store for Business to push out the company portal app so that then people can do other things, You'll have to do better. You're screwed. Or you'll have to do something. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that one is kind of like a good, the good starting. Yeah, the good starting point is what what's the one absolute one uh, store app that I need? And I think for a lot of people in this kind of situation, uh, Microsoft Store app will be it, not not Candy Crush. Well, yeah, and, and yes, that's correct. So is there anything else in your slides or should I do? Uh, so I've got a few more things. Um, so so what are some of the things that we do know? So this is where we're sort of getting into, okay, there's things that we have been told, but there's also a lot of stuff that we haven't been told explicitly. We can sort of come up with our own creative ideas of how things are going to get implemented. But if we take a look here, um, anyone who's already got apps on their device that are covered by or that were deployed by store for business or store for education um, it's yeah it's going to keep working it's going to keep auto updating etc it's on your machine um, so it's good to go now the problem there is is that if someone goes okay well that group of users or devices they're not my concern it's everyone all the new devices and users that I'm, I'm onboarding they're my concern uh -uh. because what if someone needs to reset their device it's an existing user with an existing device. So you've got to make sure that, you know, if someone's trying to sort of just be, you know, try to sort of start putting too limited a scope in terms of who gets these versions before they expand it out to everyone, it could start catching existing people or devices out sooner rather than later. Um, and we'll, 
actually, and we'll talk about the targeting, uh, I think, on the next slide. Now, the next next slide here is just in terms of like the repositories aren't going to, or the store slash repositories aren't going to keep an unlimited version of previous versions there. So I think right now they're saying like two to three previous versions of something will be uh, will be maintained. Um, and if you want to keep older versions of something, because that's the version that you must have for compatibility reasons or whatever, um, then that's up to you. So basically you'd have to download them and convert them into, basically push them into Intune as a line of business app for that particular version. I, other things as well, they, they haven't given great guidance on it yet, but yeah, saying that, you know, if you just want to use um, app auto updates, um, you know, uh, as opposed to, you know, having the store handle updates for you, um, you know, saying that, yeah, because, uh, you know, package manager supports auto update, that it's not something where, just because you're deploying through Intune in the future, that it's the thing that has to have some kind of control layer over the top of that. And then the final bit here is that, uh, you know, like, I guess, things around dependencies. Uh, so we're not going to see any kind of dependency support in in GA. Uh, so sometime post GA, uh, yeah, that's where it's like, oh, you'll need this Visual C redistributable from 15 years ago before this crappy old app will work. Um, and that, that, so that's coming. Now, what we don't know yet, so there's just an extreme lack of documentation, and it's really just two key blog posts on um, on tech community that cover some of these things. Hopefully, we see more of this stuff coming, and this is still one of the reasons why, like, like what are we now? We're getting, like, getting close to mid, mid-March now. Oh, sorry, mid-February uh, now. So the please don't scare me like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That means that yeah, it's, that means in a couple of days we've got workplace ninjas. Yeah, well, it means <laughs> um, in a, a yeah. month's time we're over in the US. Yeah. So yeah, so with the yeah, so the fact that we still don't have documentation, a lot of documentation or official documentation from the content team, that's still what's making me a bit nervous about that thirty first of March. Date. Uh, yeah, maybe I'm, I'm just being too pessimistic here, but you know, we've seen magic. Yeah, we have seen magic happen because once again, we have to remember that date will not shift. It's impossible for that date to shift. <laughs> we just redefine what calendars and dates and times are in order to meet to meet the SLA. Now, the other thing that we, yeah, that we've been told is kind of coming, but we don't really have any real information yet is like, just like how will Intune, like apart from you doing your own you know, PowerShell scripting and your own app deployments, et cetera, like that how will Intune integrate with other, like with public and private repositories that aren't Microsoft hosted? Um, it's, it's just, again, this is one of those things that's a wait and see. They're saying, oh, yes, some of this stuff is happening, some of it's under consideration, but we don't really have any anything, really. Magic. Apart from that. Um, now, I just wanted to spend a minute on this one before I hand over to Steve, because there's a few things that Steve wanted to talk about as well. But one of, as soon as, whenever, or whenever there is kind of like a major change like this that takes place, it's always a good housekeeping opportunity to go through and say, okay, how have we been targeting things in the past? Um, and it's, so you can sort of see here, I've got some terrible, you know, terrible examples in here where like I'm including all users and all devices, but then I'm, at least I'm using filters to include right. or exclude. Filters, fix the problem. Yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's really the main thing on that top one of, in that, you know, in the first two example is, in the past, when people were putting, when people were initially doing app deployment, like I'm guessing in a lot of cases, people would have been using dynamic groups, et cetera, to go through and do some of that, even though we all knew that there were potential time delays before things would be recognized, et cetera, there. But at least now it's something where, like, if people have done this kind of stuff, but they haven't been using filtering in the past, use filtering now. Uh, you yeah. Use it as an exercise to review your process. Correct. Yeah. And so even there, the things like, like how many environments have you been in where you've got included all devices, but then they're targeting a Windows app yep. to all devices. Or all users. <laughs> Sorry? All users. They're all users, yes. And so, yep. yeah, look at all these iOS and Android devices. They're all complaining. Yeah. 
they're, they're getting they're getting like oh it's not sending it to them it's all good it's like no but it makes it hard as an admin to review what's going through yeah. and it's, it's screwing up your metrics and because you yeah. get so many not upon oh, yeah so yeah so filtering is your friend um and if you haven't worked with it, like probably the other thing as well here that kind of ties into other stuff is, you know, you've got filtering, uh, yeah, the filters that you've got in Intune show up in uh, in uh, conditional access as well now. So you've got multiple places that, you know, if you invest properly in creating filters, it's not just an Intune thing. They, they can be useful in other places. Um, now, obviously, you've got other things like showing toast notifications, update schedules, it's, or update deadlines, but... Um, but really here, just the big takeaway is, yeah, just make sure that you've got filtering, yeah, you've got a filtering plan if it's something where you've kind of avoided it because you already had a lot of this stuff set up before it became available. This is the perfect chance to go back and say, hey, filtering, time for us to figure figure out how to make things more extensive. So did you want to do a demo of yes. this? So if you want to try and grab the controls. Demos. Uh, it's that screen there. I'm going to share a window, which is for that one. Uh, so one of the things that I want to talk about, and, and we're doing a video soon about it in the Intune training, but I just want to reiterate this one because it's a super important one. How many people on the call use the PowerShell script to remove the store applications from their SOE, from their image, from everything like that? Because it's like, I'm just going to have my apps and that's it. And then I'm going to get rid of all the bloatware and say, yep, cool. And then all of a sudden you don't have Notepad, you don't have a calculator, you don't have a huge amount of uh, store applications that are actually core apps now. So there are build a script for that to remove. Uh, to yeah, remove. well, why, why are you using the script when you can just do it natively? Uh... Good question. Uh, maybe something cosmetic in Intune stuff. That's a very good point. So <laughs> the scenario that we're going to talk about today, if I can just move this around so I can actually toggle, is if we go here, I'm going to use an example of the Feedback Hub. It's available on every Windows 11 device and Windows 10 device by default. We do want you to provide feedback. Please provide feedback. But if you're in an organization where it's regulated and you don't want notifications or messages going out through the feedback hub, what you can do is you can go here and you can go add and I can go, all right, well, here's my new store. All right. I select that. And I go and I'm, go I'm going to go and search for feedback hub. Because that's the name of the application. Not there. I can't find it. But let's, let's, let's do an easier one. One that everybody wants to remove. Let's say, what, mail and calendar? Yep, we can select that. So it's actually finding it in the database, but it's not finding the feedback hub. So how we can do that is if we go to shop or microsoft.com or store.microsoft.com and then go to the shop, uh, you can search here. So if we just go microsoft.com, uh, and we're going to search for feedback up. Oh, and you'll see it here. Because I've already searched there, it will go straight in. But why am I making the effort of doing this is because we're looking at this little section here in the URL where it has the application ID. So if I copy that out of the URL and I go back over to the search the store, I hit control V, it now comes up. So you can select that application and we go down the bottom and we go select and you'll see that it now populates all of the information around the feedback hub. What this then allows us to do from there, and the one thing it doesn't do is add the logo. It'd be nice, but baby steps. Um, you can then go in here and go add all devices and you can then filter it down to your Windows devices. My scenario, I have a HP device, so I'm going to filter that. But this is where you can turn around, rather than having to have a script that does everything, you go and deploy each one of those applications into your store in uh, Intune. Once it's in there, you can then go and send an uninstall command. Why is that cool? It's because then it allows us to see 
the success failure rate of that installation per device. So you have the auditability, trackability, and everything associated without having to create a separate script for each application. Um, so yeah. And retry is assuming that you're not doing Correct. some kind of proactive remediation. Correct, it, it will continue to retry. It will do everything until it's uninstalled. So I just wanted to call that one out because I think it's, it's an important one. Um, Adam talked about it in, uh, for the AAD, not AAD, the Windows 10, an old business store. Uh, it worked somewhat the same, but this one's just that little bit easier because you don't then need to go to businessstore.microsoft.com uh, with all the URL and then put the code in there. Because if we go across to the business store, uh, and we try and search for that feedback hub, we're going to run into the same issue. So first quarter. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that the store doesn't have, and, and I'm just flagging this, is offline mode for application installation. Uh, so if we go here and we're just going to search for feed back up, And it's actually there in this one. <laughs> and this is where you got the inconsistencies between the two. But if I go in here, and you'll see that that's the same code. If I go mail and calendar, it's actually there oh, too. It's they've messing with you now. They've fixed it. Uh, but previously, you couldn't find some of these applications. Xbox is another good example. Um, the Xbox bar and things like that wasn't visible unless you've got the code. So just a neat little trick, add those applications in there, send the uninstall and you've got the trackability. So which of the, so I guess, it, so I guess there are some things that I, like I understand things like removing like the Xbox app and you know, task their toolbar, whatever. Well, we, and mail in calendar, I definitely understand removing that. You need to keep the Xbox game bar if you want to do screen recording. The new screen. Okay. okay. Did you know that Stream can do screen recording? Stream, yeah. yeah. I only found that out a week or two ago when somebody's like, oh, no, I just use Stream. And it's like, okay, but I don't have to think about resolution, frame rate, bit rate. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. And it forces every recording to be 15 minutes or less. <laughs> I'm sold. <laughs> exactly. Um, so does that make sense to everybody on the call from a logic point of view? And, and do you see value in how that works? I think it's a good move. I think really appreciate, uh, uh, like, <laughs> I, I never even knew that you could use this trick. Like, I, I was always of going to, use that feature for deployment never thought it could remove the out of the box apps uh as well so thanks a lot for this yeah and, and that's probably one of the things that isn't really spoken about is with the store you can remove whatever app technically you can send uninstalls for the apple apps as well i think or am i wrong not sure. Let me have a quick look. Yep. So you can actually send uninstalls mm -hmm. for Apple apps as well. So if if somebody goes and installs an application on one of your iPhones, you can also send that uninstall as well. And this is also valuable in an organization where somebody's gone and installed Netflix on 20 computers and it's like, no, nope, no more. Rather, rather than blocking it at the proxy, I'm just going to remove the app. Um, Absolutely. This is good. I think uh, I just got a blog post idea. So thank you very <laughs> much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> it, it, it works for Windows 365 as well. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm going to write up <laughs> right now. <laughs> so, 
the blog post is going to be targeted and I, I'll mention your name. Thanks for the tip. <laughs> no, no problem. <laughs> I don't have anything else on this one, but uh, that was where I was wanting to get to. Yeah, so, okay, so, yeah, so I guess then there's, like, there's still a ton of stuff we don't know yet. Um, so this is probably just going to be, like, maybe by the time we have next month's meeting, who knows, maybe there'll be an, a huge influx of fresh information. Uh, but if it's if it's not, like, let's say that there really hasn't been much announced prior to next month. It's probably not worth revisiting it until April so we can see what the fallout is. Well, um, let, let's be very transparent here. I doubt that we'll do an April user group because uh, we'll be away. I mean, oh, and I think the week before I'll be around. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're working on a lot of assumptions there. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so is, is there anything else anybody wants to talk about on the record around that packaging or deployment, the Win32, uh, the new Win Git repos, anything like that? Mm. I'm going to take that as a no. You're all running yeah. short. Yeah, and look, and, big markers. and I have to say, like, oh. and I appreciate that out of courtesy to Arash that nobody showed examples of how to move, how to remove Dell pre-installed apps. That instead, yeah, you know, the focus was on other vendors. So I have to thank everyone for dynamically adjusting your content to not offend an attendee. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that that was the nail in the coffin. <laughs> were, you, were you sitting there waiting, saying, "Please, please, don't show anything, Dell"? <laughs> <laughs> I think there's still one vendor who was the best at doing the pre-installs, and they had 48 apps pre-installed. Yep. And it was not Dell. It was not HP. It was not a brand you would normally. Yes. It's a brand you would not generally choose to purchase. Correct. But who claimed that they were one you wanted? Yeah. Like, I just had a question on, like, you know, how, how are you seeing the traction in the market where all the vendors are embarking their apps on, on, on the repository? This way, the whole whole packaging bit and making using PSAD and creating the package and then deploying all that goes away. Like, are you seeing good traction like all at least all 80% of the big vendors have put their apps in? It's so it's it's actually looking pretty like so that the big ones at least and I guess this is the problem is that depending on what segment you're in depending on what industry you're in, depending on what country you're in, who you perceive the top software vendors to be can vary quite dramatically. Uh, but if you sort of take a look at it, I guess, at a global level, I think there's pretty good representation in there uh, of, you know, like, let's say, like, or probably, probably better to say there's good representation if you're thinking of apps that an enterprise is going to deploy. Being in being made available this way, uh, so there's probably like a bunch of niche things or things that specifically target SMB that haven't made their way in there yet. Uh, so it's so at least this approach, though, you know, you're not having to go through and re and basically convert things into an AppX file or whatever, like you had to do previously to get things into business store or just regular store. Um, that's like that's a huge step in the right direction, and that's already opened the floodgates in terms of just the random things you can find in the store now. And it's like, yes, they're going to launch a, an XE based installer. So yes, we've gone backwards in terms of you know there are like so many nice things about doing AppX deploys through the store. Uh, 
as long as the Apex, as long as the things you wanted were available as an Apex in the store. And that was the, you know, that was the big problem. So, so I think there's like a, yeah, there's pretty good coverage in there, but I'm sure like everyone's going to find random things that you use that aren't, you know, that aren't in there for whatever reason. And that's where hopefully just pointing out to, you know, being able to start, you know, reaching out to or extending, you know, how whatever the mechanism is to extend out to, you know, private repositories to um, third party repositories. That's, you know, I think that's the way that any org that doesn't want to release con or relinquish control over distributing that software, they want to sort of track everything from their side. Um, and some of the things that they've already sort of got in some of the, the blog posts they are talking about being able to authenticate against the, uh, you know, the other repositories. So it's not something where everyone goes in as anonymous and it's public facing. So I think they like, even if we haven't got that functionality yet, it's stuff that they know needs to be in there. So I think, like, I think we'll have pretty good coverage overall, but there's always going to be something random that will, even within the same vendor, we'll go, why does this vendor have, you know, 10 of their 11 products there, but the 11th one, they refuse to release this way. Quite insightful, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll stop um, recording. That's yeah. good. Yeah. So if anyone's got few other topics that they want to cover off but don't really want record, I uh, just I want recorded, let me just stop the recording and we can just continue on with just general conversation.